In this video, we're going to discuss properties of sums or series. And we're going to introduce some convenient notation known as sigma notation, which allows us to write sums and series in a nice compact way. But before we get started, let's look at an, a really interesting problem. How many squares are on a chessboard? Since the chessboard is eight by eight, some people quickly answer 64. And then maybe after thinking about it for a second, they say, oh wait, the board itself is a big square, so 65. Well, it turns out that there's 204 squares on a chessboard. Why? Take a minute, pause the video, and think about it. Where does the number 204 really come from? Before we answer that question, let's define some terms. Sigma notation is a notation that allows us to write out a potentially long series in a concise way. Suppose you had a sequence of terms, T1, T2, T3, and you want to add those terms together. Well, you would write T1 plus T2 plus T3, and let's just say there are n of these terms. There may be n is 100 or something like that. This is a long way to write out the series, and we'll call it the expanded form. The expanded form is a pain, even if we're using the dot, dot, dot. So this notation that I have over here is referred to as sigma notation. It's called that because it uses the Greek letter sigma. That's that crazy E looking thing. That Greek letter sigma tells you that you are summing the terms of the sequence. If you're wondering what sequence you're adding, well, that's given to you right here. T sub K is also often gonna be a formula for the specific sequence of terms that are being added. How do we know which terms to add? Well, that's why we have these lower and upper limits. The lower limit here tells me which term should I start with. In this case, and in many cases, we wanna start with the first term. You wanna start at the beginning. You don't need to. The lower limit could start at k equals five or k equals 17 if you wished. The upper limit is given up here. Uh, the upper limit, you'll see in some series, might be infinite because we might want to consider infinite series. By just putting that upper limit on there and using the sigma notation, I tell you exactly what sequence needs to be added and exactly which terms. Let's look at an example. In this example, we're given series that are written in expanded form and we're asked to write them using sigma notation. Let's work out letter A together. For letter A, I'll write my sigma, which again, that's a Greek letter S, and it tells me that I'm going to sum or find a series. I'll notice that the sequence of terms that are being added together are just one, two, three, four, and so on. So these are just the natural numbers. I'm going to describe that with a K right here. And then I'm going to let my lower limit be K equals 1. And my upper limit, that'll be 100. The reason for this is when I plug in K equals 1, I'll get the 1. And then that lower limit will increase to 2. And I'll plug in 2, and I'll get 2. Then it'll increase to 3, and so on and so forth, until I get to this upper limit. And when I plug in 100 into just that plain old K, well, then I get 100. So I've achieved the goal. I've, I've written letter A in sigma notation. One note, I tend to use K instead of N for these in case I want to use N as the upper limit. Pause the video and try to write letter B and letter C in sigma notation. Let's discuss solutions for B and C. Writing something in sigma notation is actually a little harder than you might expect. The reason for this is there's not actually only one way to write something in sigma notation. It's not unique. There are a lot of different ways you can express different sums using sigma notation. However, 
In B and C, I'm going to express it using a lower limit of one by counting with the first term. Our first job is going to be to come up with an equation or an expression that I can put inside the sigma operator that's going to describe one, four, seven, ten, this pattern of numbers that I see in my series. Well, what that's really saying is I've got a sequence. One, comma, four, comma, seven, comma, ten. What, what formula, explicit formula, describes that sequence? Well, that's just an arithmetic sequence. And we know for an arithmetic sequence that a1 plus b times n minus 1 will describe what's going on there. So, okay, the first term is a 1, and the common difference is a 3. So 1 plus 3 times n minus 1, when you simplify that, it will be 3n minus 2. Now, when I write that expression inside the sigma notation, I'm going to be careful to write 3k minus 2 instead of 3n minus 2, and that's important. It's very important that you have agreement between your counter here, your lower limit, k equals 1, and the variable that you're using in your expression. Otherwise, when k is 1, I wouldn't be plugging it in uh, to the expression that I have there. Okay, now last, to complete letter B, I'll have to come up with the upper limit. And be very, very careful here. The upper limit is not, in this case, 100. Now, why is that? In letter A, my upper limit was simply the last term, right? The, the last term, but be careful with that. In letter A, we were just keeping track of the numbers from one to 100, right? And when you plug 100 into K, you get 100, right? If you put an upper limit of 100 in letter B, then you would be adding one plus four plus seven plus 10, and you would continue until the number that you get when you plug 100 into 3K minus two. And therefore, 100 is incorrect. What you need to do instead is you need to take 3N minus two and set it equal to 100 and solve for N. When you take 100, set it equal to 3N minus two and solve for N, you get 102 divided by three, which is 34, and 34 is the correct upper limit. Our last example, letter C, is certainly the most challenging one that we have on here. There's a lot going on. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use uh, a nice problem solving strategy where I pretend it's a slightly simpler problem for the time being. I'm gonna pretend that it's one plus three plus five plus seven plus nine and so on all the way up to plus 999. I'm going to ignore for the moment the fact that the signs are alternating and I'm going to just try to describe the sum of the odd numbers that are presented here. I'll start with k equals 1. The expression that I'll use is 2k minus 1. Now I know that for a couple reasons. 2k minus 1 is a nice formula that always describes an odd number. And that's because two times any integer would be an even number. If you subtract one, it's always an odd number. I also could figure that out by writing the numbers one, three, five as a sequence, recognizing that it's an arithmetic sequence, a sub n, first term is one, common difference is two, just like that, and then simplifying from there, not forgetting to put k in place of the end. Okay, now what's the upper limit? Once again, the upper limit is not going to be 999. And that's because, well, quite obviously, 999 is not the 999th odd number, right? If you plug 999 into 2k minus 1, you get 1,997. And we don't want to add all the way up to 1,997. So what we need to do just like before, is we need to set 999 equal to 2k minus 1. Add 1, that means 2k is 1,000, and k is 500. 
So what we found is our upper limit is 500, which is to say that 999 is the 500th odd number. Okay, sort of done this example, but not quite because now I need to take care of the alternating sign business that I just pretended was not there in the beginning. Oh boy. Well, I, I know a sequence that alternates signs. Uh, minus one times any number will change its sign. If, if you have a five and you multiply it by a minus one, it'll be a negative five. And then if you take the negative five and multiply it by a minus one, it'll be a positive five. So this is a nice little thing, like maybe fact that you, you want to keep in mind. If you'd like your sequence for whatever reason to alternate signs, and you'll, you'll see a lot of these, then just use a negative one to the kth power, right? And now we just want to think about whether I should keep it the kth power or if that would make the odd number terms negative and the even number terms positive or vice versa. So what I like to think about is, okay, check this out. Let's see if it works. When I plug one into this formula over here, I've got two times one minus one multiplied by negative one. Ooh, that's no good because that'll give me a negative one and I want to start with a positive one. When I plug in two, it's going to give me a positive three when I want a negative three. All right, it's like it's just off by a little tiny bit. So all you need to do is put another plus one up here in the exponent. That'll change it so that the odd number terms are positive and the even number terms are negative. There were a lot of details in that last example. So let's step back for a second and talk about the big idea. We're gonna use sigma notation, not just because it's a more convenient way of writing out really long sums, but because we're going to learn properties of the sigma notation, and it's going to allow us to quickly evaluate a larger variety of sums than we could work out before. Before, the only ones we knew how to work out were arithmetic and geometric. We're going to talk now about some different properties that's going to open the, the floodgates to all different types of series that we can uh, evaluate quickly. Here's our first property, and it's called the constant rule. Imagine you have to evaluate the sum from 1 to n of c, where c is some constant. Maybe c is 17 or maybe it's 5. The point is when k, this lower limit, they, I call it the counter sometimes, when this changes from k equals 1 to 2 and you're moving across your series and adding up terms, c is always just c. So what I have here is just a fancy way of writing c plus c plus c right? Plus C. And the question, of course, is how many times? Well, N times, because the upper limit's N and the lower limit was 1. So this is just C plus C plus C added together N times, and thus the constant rule tells us the sum from 1 to N of a constant is just N multiplied by that constant. Our next property, the constant multiple rule. Suppose now you have a constant as well, but it's actually multiplied by some other sequence that maybe you know things about. When k equals 1, this would evaluate to c times t1, the first term in the sequence. When k equals 2, this would be c times t2, and then c times t3. Notice that I'm putting plus signs between the terms. Again, that's what the sigma notation. Re resist any... I guess, urge to put commas between the terms because commas would say we have a sequence and sigma notation means we have a series. I finish at C times TN because the upper limit is N. Okay, how can I simplify this? Well, I notice that every term has a C so I can factor it out. And what do I see then? After I factor out a C, right, I have another series, a much simpler series. And so I can write that series in sigma notation, k equals 1 to n of t sub k. Okay, so what this constant multiple rule tells us is anytime you see a constant, maybe 5 or 7 or something like that, multiplied by some other series, pull it out. Factor it out in front of the, the sigma. Let's look at another problem. I call this the distributive rule, 
And this applies when you have two different series added together. You know, what if you had a arithmetic series plus a geometric series and you had to, had to work that out? You know, so it would kind of work out to A1 plus B1 when you plugged in one, plus, since it's sigma notation, A2 plus B2, plus, and you got to like just keep going all the way till you get AN plus BN since the upper limit is an N. Well, I mean, this is just recognizing that this is all addition. And it doesn't matter if I alternate A1 plus B1, A2 plus B2, or if I just say instead, I'm going to add all the A's together first. You know, why not just do all the A's first and then all of the B's se second, right? What, what this means is, let me put these in sigma notation now, the sum of sequence A, right, would look like that. And then the sum of sequence B, the second one, would look like that okay so oh that what that means is you can think about almost distributing uh, a sigma like that, that big crazy e looking thing you think of it as almost distributing through addition right and that's why i call it the distributive rule now really it's just because you know addition is associative that allows us to do this let's look at another problem Now we start to get into the properties that where you got to actually do a little maybe memorization. This is the sum from 1 to n of k. It's the sum of the first k natural numbers. So it's 1 plus 2 plus 3. We've seen this a couple times now. For example, we saw when Gauss added 1 to 100. We saw it in an induction proof. And perhaps you remember that there's a nice closed formula that we can use to work out this sum just n times n plus 1 over 2. Whether you're thinking about it as an arithmetic sum or uh, the, the proof from the inductive step doesn't matter, anytime you see sigma k, you're like, oh, I know how to work that out. What's the upper limit? n? Uh, plug in n and then multiply it by n plus 1, divide by 2. Uh, so in Gauss's case, his upper limit was 100. So he had to do 100 times 101 divided by 2, 5,050, without actually doing all the addition. That's an important property to know, formula to memorize. Oh, what about the squares? Uh, this is another interesting one here. Uh, so this is one squared plus two squared plus three squared plus, what about, okay, what about n squared? That's where it would stop. We also saw this in an induction proof. This sum could be found using the shorthand formula n times n plus one times two n plus one all over six, right? The sum of the squares can be evaluated quickly. Anytime you see sigma k squared, you can use that formula. And you might think, well, when in the world am I going to use a formula like that? Well, say, for example, that somebody asked you to evaluate the sum from one to eight of k squared. And you said, hey, I can add one squared plus two squared all the way up to eight squared. That Sounds kind of annoying. I got to square them all, add them together, or I could just do 8 times 8 plus 1 times 2 times 8 plus 1 all over 6. And, and when you work out the arithmetic there, you happen to get the number 204. And if you remember in the beginning of this video, I asked you, how many squares are there on an 8 by 8 checkerboard? And I think we've seen why that's our answer. Let's look at an example. In this example, I'll show how you can use the properties of sums that we've established to evaluate this particular series. The very first thing that we should do is take those binomials and multiply them out so that you get k squared minus 5k plus 3k or minus 2k minus 15. What this allows us to do is to think about a complicated series with three terms in it as being equivalent to three simple series. So here they are, the three simple series that I'm referring to. The sum from 1 to 10 of k squared, plus the sum from 1 to 10 of negative 2k, plus the sum from 1 to 10, negative 15. This might seem like, well, you just made things a little more complicated by using that distributive rule for series. But the truth is, I've actually made it much simpler. 
I'm going to take it a step further, and I'll take that middle series there, and I'll factor out the constant multiple of a negative 2. I'm using the constant multiple rule there. The negative 2 is kind of factored out in front of the signal. And now I'm ready to evaluate the series. I've gotten to the point that I've got a formula for everything that I need to do. Uh, just to point that out here, sigma k squared, we've got a formula for that. Sigma k, we've got a formula for that. And the sum of a constant, we've got a formula for that too. So let's go through and evaluate our solution. First, sigma k squared. The formula is n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 over 6. In this case, the n is 10. Now, minus 2 times sigma k. For sigma k, the formula is n times n plus 1 over 2. And again, the n is 10. Last but not least, we have the sum of a constant. And our constant is negative 15. So we just multiply that constant by the upper limit of 10. And this expression right here is the answer to our problem. If you're working this out without a calculator, it might be worth doing some cancellation before you uh, try to jump in and uh, you know, mentally calculate anything. For example, I can, I can cancel a 2 in the 10 with a 2 in the 6, and I can cancel the 3 down here then with a 3 in the 21. And it makes the expression a little simpler uh, to work out. But if you have a calculator, then feel free, just punch it in and, and be careful not to make any errors. You should get 125. If you're wondering, what does that 125 represent? What did I just find out? Well, if you go back to the very beginning, this series that we were looking at here, when k was 1, if we plug it in, we get negative 4 times 4. Now we let k equal 2. When we plug in 2, we get negative 3 times 5. Oops, sorry, negative 3 times 5. When k equals 3, we plug it in, we get something. When k equals 10, we get 5 times 13. If we were to work out all those multiplications and add them all together, I should get 125. It was actually much more efficient to use those properties of sums, and that's just with an upper limit of 10. If the upper limit were something greater than 10, it would be even more valuable. Let's take a look at another example. In this example, we're asked to evaluate a series, a series that certainly looks simple enough. But if you look closely, there's one little detail that's going to complicate things. Did you notice that the lower limit is 5 instead of 1? That's a problem, because all the formulas that we've been using so far, for sigma k and sigma k squared, well, they all assume that you're going to start with the first term, with k equals 1. And so we have to figure out how we can adjust this series, how we can manipulate it, so that those formulas still apply. One way to do it, I like to refer to as wishful thinking. When I'm using the wishful thinking strategy, I'm just going to say, man, I really wish this was a 1. But in the back of my head, I'm going to keep in mind that it was, in fact, a 5. If it were a 1, then that would mean I'll do 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 3 squared plus 4 squared plus time for a color change. 5 squared plus 6 squared, okay, dot, 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 24 squared. Maybe you can see where I'm going with this. The series that I want to evaluate, the original one, the one with k equals 5 as the lower limit, it's written right here in blue. This is what I want, okay? Well, I've got a formula for this whole thing right here. Right? That's, what that's what's expressed in wishful thinking. And I also can come up with a formula for this part in red. That's not too hard. That's just the sum of the first four squares. And so I can see a nice way to evaluate the series that I was after, the sum from 5 to 24, 
of k squared should be equivalent to the sum from 1 to 24 of k squared. That shows me all of the terms above, both the blue and the red, minus the sum from k equals 1 to 4 of k squared. That's the piece that's just in the red right here. I overcounted those when I worked out 1 to 24. So by subtracting them, I didn't overcount anymore. And thus, the answer to this problem can be found by using a formula on this part. That would be 24 times 25, n times n plus 1, times 2n plus 1, that's 49, over 6. And then subtracting what you get when you use a formula on this part. And that would be 4, 4 is your n this time, times 5, times 2 times 4 plus 1 would give you a 9, all over 6. And when you work all that out, you get... 4,870. Okay, there's another way to do this problem as well. The reason to learn a second method is so that you're flexible in your thinking about sigma notation. Sigma notation isn't just about plugging things into some formulas that you memorize. It's really starting to understand what happens when you start to accumulate terms. And so it's good to see different ways you can algebraically manipulate sigma notation. So here's another method. I really don't like in this problem that k equals 5. In fact, I don't like the letter k at all. Let's say I switch letters. I use the letter j instead, and I start j at 1. Well, if k is 5 when j is 1, then that must mean that j plus 4, 1 plus 4, is equal to k. All right, I figured out a nice linear relationship between j and k. That means when k reaches 24, if k is 24 right here, then j plus 4 would be 24, and I guess j would only be 20. Okay, so so far what I've done is I've just made a little change in variable. I made my lower limit start at 1. And when it starts at 1, it ends at 20. That's telling me there's 20 terms in the series. And the original series, from 5 squared to 6 squared, all the way up to 24 squared, yeah, that had 20 terms as well. So, so far, I'm in good shape. I've just represented my sigma a little different. The last thing that I need to do is replace k squared, right? If k is going to be squared, then that means the uh, expression that I want inside my new sigma notation would be j plus 4 squared, right? Because now that's all equivalent there. So I've got a new way to represent this sum, okay? And then you could check that it works. I mean, when I plug j equal to 1 into this series here, I get 1 plus 4, that's 5, and then you square it just like when you were plugging k equals 5 in before. The advantage of this new representation, of course, is that the lower limit starts at 1, and all the formulas that we're learning apply. Right? So I get this when I multiply the binomial. j plus 4 squared would be j squared plus 8j plus 16. And now I'm able to distribute that sigma so that I work out the sum from 1 to 20 of j squared, and then 8 times the sum from 1 to 20 of j, and then the sum from 1 to 20 of the constant 16. And now this is simply a matter of using the formulas we've worked out. For j squared, we do n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 all over 6, and then for j, we do n times n plus 1 over 2, and for the constant, c times n. That's it. And again, when you work all this out, you're going to get 4,870. So there you go. 
two different ways to work out of a series, even though the lower limit isn't one. The key thing is you gotta come up with a way to make it one so that you can work with those formulas that you know, and you're not resorting to just doing five squared plus six squared plus seven squared. So that's a really inefficient way to add things up. We're just about done the video. So it's probably a good time to summarize the things we've learned so far. We learned the constant rule. If you want to sum a constant, it's simply the same as adding the constant to itself n times, and thus we can just multiply the constant by the upper limit of the sum. We learned that any constant multiple, like 2 or negative 7, well, we could pull that out in front of the sum because of the distributive problem. We saw any time you have multiple terms added together inside of a sum, we can also think about them as being summed separately. And I refer to this as the distributive rule because it appears like the sigma is being distributed through to the two terms. And then we also learned, I guess we learned this previously when we did induction proofs, that the sum of the first n natural numbers can be found using this formula where the sum of the first n squares can be found using this formula. And the last thing that we learned is, well, if the lower limit is anything other than one, we can make some adjustments either using wishful thinking or change in variable that's gonna allow us to still use these properties. But why did we stop at squares? Can we keep going? Can we come up with a formula that finds the sum of the first n perfect cubes? I'll leave you with a little video that might pique your interest on that front. Check, check, check. One, two, three, two, three.